Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art. Hi, I'm P. Scott Cunningham, and from the studios at South Florida PBS, this is Artloft. Welcome back. In this episode of Art Loft, we get bookish with literary happenings big and small. Each year, hundreds of authors and thousands of readers converge on downtown Miami for the nation's premier literary festival, the Miami Book Fair. The Miami Book Fair features panel discussions, kids' activities, and a street fair. Ann Bocock, journalist and host of the South Florida PBS program, Between the Covers, met up with a few of the authors in town to discuss their latest works. Ridley Pearson, thank you for joining and us at the book fair. Thank you for having me. You've been here before. I have a couple times. The good old Miami book fair. I've played music here for 17 of the 23 years I've come here. The, uh, With the rock, rock bottom, bottom remainders. remainders. Yeah, you, you, the only you. band that can drive people like, you know, cowboys herding cattle. We can drive everybody away from wherever we play. For your, for your listeners, it's, a, it's an all authors band with Stephen King, Amy Tan, Dave Barry, Mitch Album, Scott Turow, Greg Isles, James McBride. Um, it's really, really fun. And we are terrible. But You're terrible. We're not, terrible not for a, a good cause. Okay. Amy Tan has said, I would do this to kill the whales. So, so now we know you're a rock star, but what yes, is it like to be at the Miami Book Fair with thousands of book lovers? You, you are the, the literary rock star. Well, it's, it's nice to be there with book lovers, but you're also here with 600 really good authors. And you feel about this small. You feel like a grain of sand on the beach of literature. You have written, I've lost count, somewhere around 50 yep, plus a little over 50 books. books. Half of them crime suspense, I, I would call Oh, good. Them. I thought you were going to say half of them garbage. No. <laughs> and the other half, <laughs> the young adult, yes. middle school age. Yeah, Tell grade. me about that. Well, I think, you know, um, you become a parent. Um, it's a parent, you become a parent. And uh, you start reading books to your kids. Uh, my girls are now 19 and 18, but, you know, for their first 11 years or so, I read to them every night. And you just get to a point as a writer where you think, wait, you know, I, I could do this too. And then somebody offers you an opportunity. In, in my case, it was Disney. Um, coming to me and asking me to write one of my adult crime books set inside their theme parks for more of a middle grade audience. Um, and at that same time, my then five-year-old daughter asked me how Peter Pan met Captain Hook, and I didn't have an answer to that. And I brought that question to Dave Barry, the um, unbelievable Dave Barry, down here in Miami for one of the book fairs. I was staying at his house. And we decided maybe there was a prequel to Peter Pan, uh, how a boy became the iconic Peter Pan, and that became Peter and the Star Catchers. So, you know, we, I just sort of fell in to writing for middle grade and discovered the joy of it. It's just so much fun. Speaking of a prequel, the new book, which is Lock and Key, book one, The Inv Initiation. Initiation. We have a prequel with some very important literary characters that you <laughs> we took do. on. Yeah. We've got You're saying Sherlock I rip Holmes. off everybody? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I love villains in my crime novels. I, I really, uh, I love sort of the dark side. And uh, I teethed on all the Sherlock Holmes short stories and novels. I think there's 54 or 56 of them. And uh, that's what got me into forensics back when I was one of the early forensic writers. And um, in looking at Benedict Cumberbatch strutting his stuff on PBS and those great things, I just, I sat there and thought, yeah, but if he's a present day Sherlock, how did that guy, how did that guy get there? Especially when it came to James Moriarty, because so much has been written about Sherlock. Um, there have been a few things written about Moriarty, but usually as an adult, not as a, as a young man. And for me, after a lot of books where I write hero arcs, uh, this was a chance to write the reverse, to write a kid who's, you know, from a wealthy family. Maybe he's a little stuck up, but he's a nice guy. And by the end of this trilogy, 
he's going to be primed to be the world's greatest criminal mastermind. And I went, yeah. Nothing better than that. Ridley Pearson, it has been such Thank a pleasure. Thank you, man. Happy book fair. Thank you. Ina Gayloff, thank you so much. Thank you first for writing the book and thank you for joining me at the Miami Book Fair. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Before we get into this, and I loved every page, you're gonna win for longest title of a book ever. It is Food in the City, New York's Professional Chefs, Restaurateurs, Line Cooks, Street Vendors, and Purveyors Talk About What They Do and Why They Do It. This is really a departure for, you, you've written many books. Yes. Nothing like this. Nothing like this. Nothing is much fun, too. As much fun to write and as much fun to read. Where, how'd you get inspired? What, what brought this on? I had come back to New York City from living out of the city, I mean, out of the state for years, and I noticed that everybody was involved in food. Suddenly, instead of lining up for movie theaters, they were lining up for cronuts. They were lining up to buy cookies on the street. And they were photographing food, Instagramming food. They were sharing food. They were talking about food. And I said, maybe food is the subject that I should be looking into. So I was walking down the street one day. I saw a, ba a butcher shop. And the guy was just sitting there, literally like he was waiting for me to come in. And I walked in, I said, what is it like? I you know, talked to him, I said, tell me what is it like to be a butcher these days? And he was so funny and he was so cool that I said, you know, maybe there's a book in this. And indeed, I started looking for others like him and there was. You let the stories tell themselves, the people tell their own story. You didn't rewrite it. That's correct. This is called an oral history. So what I did was I came with a tape recorder. When I picked my people, there are 53 people, as you said, in all different areas of food. And so I, I needed to know the right questions, and I decided to ask the questions that I wanted the answers to. And, and so that's how I decided what to ask them. But, but in answer to your, what you said, the oral history, they talk into a tape recorder. All I do is edit it down. When I picked up the book, I thought, I'm really going to like this book. This is going to entertain me. And yes, it did. What I did not expect was that it was going to be so inspiring. Yes. There's a, the first chapter is called Starting from Scratch. And that is mostly immigrants, not all immigrants. But it does talk about the passion that these people have for what they do and the lengths they're willing to go to, to reach the American dream. And your trip to the Fulton Fish Market. The best, I loved that. It was at three in the morning. I interviewed Bobby Weiss, and I went early because I also interviewed Sandy Ingram from the Grand Central Oyster Bar, and he was telling me about going at three in the morning and walking around and picking the fish that they're gonna sell at the, the Oyster Bar. So I decided to also talk to someone who sells the fish at the, Grand, at the uh, Fulton Fish Market. And it, it's amazing. It is a, literally, it's a quarter of a mile long or the size of the Empire State Building. And he was talking about what it's like for him to get up in the morning at midnight and what a life is like when your day goes, starts at midnight and goes on and you're done at 10 in the morning. He's a golfer. He said, best life in the world. This is a fabulous book, Thank Food you. in the City, Ina Yaloff. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. The book is for anybody. You don't have to be a foodie. Or a New Yorker. Or a New Yorker. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. Thank you so much for having me, and it's been fun. Margot Livesey, thank you for joining me. Mercury, is it, this is your eighth novel? I believe it's my eighth novel. And here's what I took away from it. A story of a marriage, certainly, of obsession, of choices. It's part thriller, part psychological drama. Tell me I'm close. It is about a marriage. Uh, Donald, an optometrist, originally from Scotland, like me, and his wife Viv, originally from Ann Arbor. They live in an unnamed town outside Boston with their two children. And Viv is running a riding stable and one day this fantastic horse, Mercury, um, arrives at the stables and she thinks this is a chance to fulfill the dreams of my youth, to be a champion equestrian. And 
um, she begins training Mercury, and as she trains him, she becomes convinced that someone else is interested in the horse and trying to hurt him. This story of ambition, of obsession, of choices, do you want your reader to come away with, but what if? Oh, uh, yes, what do I want the reader to come away with? I'm so interested in the subject of ambition. I think we've all been thinking a lot about ambition, ambition and women in the last year or so. And you know, when does ambition cross into being obsession? When does it become something more dangerous? And certainly for a woman, it is, it, ambition is, is a different animal it, than it is for a man. It really is. We have many more doubts, I think, about ambitious women than we do about ambitious men. Your writing is so clean and precise, and it is like poetry on the page. Do you struggle with every single sentence? I do. I, I love that you phrase the question as so in such a complimentary way. No, I have to keep sending money to organizations that plant trees because I go through so much paper. <laughs> and we are so glad you did. This is book number eight. It is Mercury, Margot Livesey. It is a phenomenal book. Thank you so much for joining me. As we continue our literary adventures, we turn to the Lewis Carroll classic, Alice in Wonderland. The Morgan Library and Museum in New York City celebrates the 150th anniversary of Alice in Wonderland's first printing. WNET New York Public Media brings us this look at the original manuscript and several early editions of the book. We're having this exhibition now um, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the first publication of Alice in Wonderland. It was our opportunity to tell the story of the story, really how it came to be. It's really a delight to be able to show the original manuscript of Alice in this exhibition. It's traveled only a handful of times since it was given to the British Library. The story of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was first told one summer afternoon. Lewis Carroll was on a rowing trip up the River Thames with Alice Little, the real Alice, and her two sisters and another friend. And along the way, the children asked for a story. Without any idea what would follow, he sends his heroine straight down a rabbit hole. Alice in Wonderland is a tale of a young girl landing in Wonderland. She goes from episode to episode, meeting character after character. There's, of course, the White Rabbit, the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, the Queen of Hearts, the Mock Turtle and the Griffin. Her conversations with these creatures bring the story to life. She spends the book trying to make sense out of this nonsensical world. Lewis Carroll, the author of this iconic story, was also a mathematics don at Christ Church College, Oxford University. His real name is Charles Letwidge Dodson. He came up with the pseudonym Lewis Carroll to publish children's books and Alice-related material for the rest of his life. It took him over two and a half years to complete the original manuscript. It's illustrated with Lewis Carroll's own pen and ink drawings he decides to publish the book. So Carol works with John Tenniel, one of the most recognizable illustrators of the day, to do the illustrations for the published book. So that's really interesting to look at Lewis Carroll's original illustrations in the manuscript together with John Tenniel's iconic illustrations. In the original manuscript, the opening that we're showing is the illustration of Alice when she's first suddenly grown very tall. She's taking up the entire length of the page. Her eyes are cast down, perhaps demurely, perhaps just looking, searching for her very distant feet. When you look at Tenniel's illustration of the same moment, it's still Alice, but some important changes have been made. She's facing the viewer, and she has this expression of shock or wonderment. She's confronting this change really head on, so there's no ambiguity about her character, which I think is more in keeping with the character that Lewis Carroll has created in text. 
So it's the way that Tenniel sort of subtly shifts the perspective or the exact moment that's being illustrated that helps add a level of, of magic to the story. It's published on July 4th, 1865. John Tenniel, the illustrator, gets a hold of one of these early uh, copies, and he's completely dissatisfied with how his illustrations have been printed. So he writes immediately to Carol. Carol thinks about it for a little while and finally decides to recall the entire edition. For this reason, there are only about 20 copies of the first edition that still survive. Alice was well received from the moment that it reappeared. Carol was interested in expanding his readership. As soon as he starts getting a slight profit from the book, he turns around and reinvests it into new editions. He's also doing something that's really interesting, which is licensing the characters, issuing later tie-ins. He publishes a facsimile of the original manuscript. These things are all very unusual for the time. I think it's his sort of branding, almost, of the story. One of the things that makes this book so influential is it doesn't conclude sort of overtly with a moral. Most children's writing up to this point would have concluded with a moral. It's incredibly playful and witty and inventive. It's an example of one of the first stories that exists just for itself, story for story's sake. Let's stay at the Morgan Library and Museum for a look at the early works of legendary author Ernest Hemingway. Declan Keeley, curator of literary manuscripts, digs into Hemingway's first drafts and early work in an exhibit titled Ernest Hemingway Between Two Wars. WNET New York Public Media has more. Ernest Hemingway Between Two Wars takes the visitor from Hemingway's experiences in Italy during the First World War, right through to his experiences on the beaches of Normandy and in the fields of France in World War II, and his subsequent attempts to write about those experiences. Hemingway seems to have been very eager to serve in the First World War, but his eyesight was too bad. So he volunteered as an ambulance driver and was stationed in Northern Italy. And it was there uh, one night when he was distributing chocolate to soldiers on the front line that he was severely injured in a mortar shell blast. He subsequently had 227 pieces of shrapnel removed from his legs. The first manuscript in the exhibition is one which Hemingway wrote in the fall of 1918 while he was convalescing at the American Red Cross Hospital in Milan. And this is Hemingway's very first attempt to grapple with his wartime experience, what was for him, let's remember, a near-death experience. And so it's also important because it's the first time that Hemingway introduces the character of Nick. Uh, Nick Adams will populate 24 of his subsequent short stories. And there's also uh, a kind of nascent relationship with a nurse, which I think reaches its full blossoming in A Farewell to Arms 10 years later. Hemingway wrote to his father in 1925 and articulated what really became his artistic credo for the next 25 years, really the remainder of his career. He says to his father, what I'm trying to do in my work is to get the reader to feel, to see, to experience, so that when they've read a work by me, whether it's a short story or a novel, they feel that they've actually experienced what they just read about. And he does that as much by omission as by what he puts in. And this, of course, leads later on to his famous iceberg theory of literature, whereby the strength of the work comes from not what's in it, but what he feels he can leave out of it. And you see him cutting away as much prose as he's writing. For Hemingway's early novel, The Sun Also Rises, visitors can see the first page of the novel. The entire novel, which he wrote in nine weeks, is recorded in first draft in seven notebooks. And we have three of the seven notebooks on view. 
so that you can see that he's often transcribing his day-to-day -day experience in that novel. It's very clear when you look at the first drafts in those notebooks that he's just transcribing conversations with friends and they're entering into the text. Hemingway met Fitzgerald in the Dingo Bar in Paris in 1925, and I think within a short space of the exhibition, you can see the full arc of their friendship. Fitzgerald, who was the older by three years, and by that point, the far more established writer, rapidly became Hemingway's literary mentor, and so Hemingway felt comfortable enough to show Scott Fitzgerald the typescript of The Sun Also Rises, and Fitzgerald was very, very critical of the first two chapters for what he called their elephantine facetiousness. And Hemingway eventually cut the text by about 40,000 words because Fitzgerald's advice was very sound. And then just three years on, after Fitzgerald critiqued Hemingway's next novel, Farewell to Arms, Fitzgerald returned to him a nine-page commentary full of suggestions, both very incisive, very ruthless criticism, but also heaped praise upon it and ended up by saying, a beautiful book it is, exclamation mark, under which Hemingway wrote, kiss my ass, E-H. And that was really the death knell for their friendship. By the time you get to the manuscript of For Whom the Bell Tolls, you can see that even at typescript stage, Hemingway is really struggling. The interlinear revisions make the page look very clotted and you can see he's beginning to slow down. The struggle is much more evident in his later manuscripts from the 40s onwards. The interwar years are the most continuously productive and years in which Hemingway seems to have exhibited the greatest fluency in his writing. And I think the whole exhibition through the drafts of the works on display give you a very vivid sense of Hemingway, the writer, and how the works came into existence. From a literary giant to a small idea with a big goal, getting more kids to read, we head to Columbus, Ohio to check out a volunteer movement aimed at boosting literacy. WOSU Public Media has the details. What we were thinking about, we wanted to do something different and unique for National Volunteer Week. So Hands On Central Ohio partnered with VESA to come up with this free little libraries project. And really the goal is to promote uh, literacy in our community and provide an opportunity for kids to have access to free books as well. So the Columbus Dispatch, they donated six newspaper dispensers to Hands On and to VESA. And those two organizations came together uh, with some of our partners to paint them and make them into little, little libraries. And so all around Columbus, we're going to place these little li libraries in places where kids don't have as much access to books. And that way they can take a book, they can leave a book, and hopefully enjoy reading. Yeah, really the goal is, you know, some kids may not have transportation or they're not walking distance to go to a, a library. So that way we're putting them where kids are already located. So a community center, an after school center. So they can, while they're already there, they can have access to books and they don't have to go to another location. And the site locations are Directions for Youth, which is on the uh, east side of Columbus. They have an after-school program there. Uh, St. Stephen's Community House, uh, as well as the John Maloney Health, Se Health Center on the south side of town. And then Jay Ashburn Junior Youth Center on the west side. And then there's also Franklinton Gardens, two uh, garden locations that will also have um, a, a library as well. And we're also so excited about the, the number of book donations that we receive. We have over 700 book donations. M Melita Foundation provided books as well as McGraw Hill Columbus Library also donated books as well. So we're really excited. 100% volunteer driven. And a lot of this is, is made possible by, by companies who just donate time, donate supplies. The paint was donated by Sherwin-Williams. 
Um, the dispensers, like I said, were donated by the dispatch, and then the volunteers come out and paint everything. We do a lot of projects. Besson manages about 30 service projects a month. We do a lot of uh, one-off projects, community drives. This one is one of the ones that got, that's gotten received the most attention. And so people from companies, from individuals, uh, have really stepped, and, stepped up and said, this is fantastic, we need more of this in the community. And so we're looking to do more little libraries yet. I think it brings together so many different types of people. You need to be creative to paint the libraries. Uh, I think people understand that education is obviously very important, reading is important, and uh, expanding opportunities for kids, for children to get books, uh, it's, it's just, it's a win-win. It's an opportunity for a child to keep a book in their home. I think it's really cool to see so many people coming together, rallying together for the common good for Columbus. Thanks for joining us on Art Loft. Connect with us on social media at Art Loft SFL and watch us anytime on the PBS app by selecting WPBT2 as your local station. For Art Loft, I'm P. Scott Cunningham. See you next time. Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art.